Have you ever thought about what it takes to succeed as a songwriter and producer? What happens when you have a certain goal in your mind? Perhaps you want to be an artist, a superstar musician. And then you change direction. What do you do? How do you make it happen? Cue the intro. Welcome to The Real Deal, where we get real about what it takes to succeed. Whether it's wealth, health, relationships, or finding your purpose, we talk to the masters to uncover the secrets to defying the odds and creating your own rock star legacy. I'm Doug, and after working on multiple Grammy-winning records as an author, transformational speaker, and your personal translightenment coach, I'm committed to your growth and success. And now, here's the real deal. All right. Well, are you ready to uh, dig into some uh, stimulating, tantalizing conversations? I love to both stimulate and tantalize wherever. At the same women. time. Yeah. You're ambidextrous. It's nice. Uh, no, I like women. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm sorry. I, was, I don't know what I was thinking. I, you know, <laughs> this is live. Got it. Oh, Andy Dexter. Uh, that that's when you you can watch any episode of Dexter and you're you're into it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, you're you're uh, agnostic in your uh, Dextoriums. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Before we begin, of course, I do need to uh, mention our sponsor. Are you feeling stressed out, perhaps overwhelmed by trepidation and or other non-resourceful emotions getting in the way to your success? Then go ahead to guidedhypnotic.com. That's guidedhypnotic.com and download your free guided hypnotic meditation, guidedhypnotic.com. All right. I, I sponsor myself, so I have to just, you know, throw that Why don't you do the whole interview in that voice? I, I could, and I, I actually have a button. You that lets me do that. <laughs> so he won't wear me out. Um, Shouldn't I be the one that has that in case I don't want people to know it's me? That's like, oh, a, right. Like, yeah. I did know, like that. A, I'll put a shadow or like a veil. Uh, I started writing for Rick Wake in 1993. That's right. When we, uh, when we start covering things that we're not supposed to be talking I, about, when names do. Uh, we gotta, I'm proud all of right. all my scars. And well, I, I want to do your intro here because uh, it, it is appropriately. Uh, short enough for me to dig into and yet powerful enough to share your, uh, your majesty. I tried, uh, I tried to, to keep it economical yet. Yeah. Majestic, which is nice. Majestic. Yeah. Mm, here we go. Yeah. Peter Sizzo, an Emmy and Grammy award winning songwriter and producer whose work has sold in excess of 100 million records worldwide. His, he has written songs for and with artists such as Jennifer Lopez, Celine Dion, Avril Lavigne, Billy Porter, Jason Mraz, M2M, Brie Larson, Diana Ross, Pixie Lot, and many, many more. His songs have also been featured in many major films and television shows. As a talented developer, he was instrumental in the early careers of Avril Lavigne, Vanessa Carlton, Billy Porter, and Pixie Lot. As a composer for children's television, he has written and produced the theme songs for hit Nickelodeon series such as Smash, Blues Clues Reboot, Rusty Rivets, Middle School Moguls, and Fresh Beat Band of Spies, as well as countless other songs for TV shows, including Peter Rabbit, Winx Club, The Fresh Beat Band, and many others. A native New Yorker, he recently moved from Manhattan to L.A. and currently resides in Marina Del Rey. Wow. Who Dude. is that guy? He is impressive. And perhaps you have some insights into... Yeah, uh, that and I, I just to to are prep as we shared so the who the what now? Are you what? kind of froze? Uh, oh, I don't know, maybe you were doing a bit, but you actually did freeze. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I have only so many pixels to deal with. So well, there's this guy, uh, there's this guy Ed Bassmaster. You ever see this guy on YouTube? Where he does no. these like, characters like the uh, the look at it. Uh, you know, where you look at this, look at that. Oh he yes, yes. So he did another character where he goes to the store and he's as normal as you and I, and he's talking to the salesman. He's talking to him and he's looking for kind of a, <laughs> and then he makes this face. It's almost like a palsy that he's yeah. pretending to have. And he just stays like that frozen for an uncomfortable amount of time. And then he just goes right back to talking. Oh, that's awesome. Good. And he does it like every, you think it's not going to happen. He, he times it so perfect. And the salespeople are so sweet. They're just sort of trying to act like they don't notice. Oh, that's it. It sounds a little bit like a, um, 
uh, impractical jokers bit too. Yeah. Well, you just uh, froze digitally and it looked like that face. <laughs> Anyway, so um, a little a little backstory, and, and first of all, thank you so much for for sharing your most valuable assets, your time, and and your wisdom. Um, we go back for a good maybe twenty plus years. Very plus. Yeah, when yeah. Did you come to uh, the WNR thing, like mid nineties. Yeah, I, I was uh, I was like yeah, I was what twenty two or something. Was I that young? 22, 20, 20, yeah, I was yeah. Forty. I was forty back then. <laughs> You've aged so well, considering. I have, I have. <laughs> um, the, the Lee press on stubble that keeps me sort of ruddy, like you. Oh, it's good. Me. Yeah, it's like a chia pet. It, yeah, it's, yeah, chia head. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was I was there at the 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 sort of at the time it was pretty groundbreaking what everyone was doing and and to be part of the the strategy there was amazing. But we are fellow Long Islanders and. Um, and you, you've done some amazing, amazing things. And you've always been one of the, the nicest, funniest guys. And I, I always loved working sessions with you because it was always, a, it was just a riot. We always had such a great time. And, and uh, yeah, thank you. So share like your, a little bit of your story because obviously you're still making it happen in the music industry, which is huge because uh, there's a lot of people who did not make it through the, uh, the tumultuous times, but let's get a little background as to how you even got into this in the first place. Well, uh, I mean, I discovered that I love music really young. I discovered that I love creativity really young. It wasn't music first. It was like drawing and then writing poems and uh, fiction uh, ish. You know, when you're eight, how much fiction are you really writing? (laughs) Remember I once saw, I became obsessed with Dante's Inferno, not at eight. No, no, I, I, the idea of it, like the, the, <laughs> it in my hands, the idea that this guy in the Odyssey at eight circles of hell, and I was like, uh, wow, I didn't actually read it except maybe the beginning of the first page, <laughs> and so that I wrote like my own right. version with like all hats and V and. <laughs> You know, it, it was very silly. And my mother, of course, told everyone that I had read Dante's Inferno in its entirety and decided I, it needed work. And I rewritten it, you, you know, and I just, no matter how many reboot. times I set her straight, I just didn't work. So, um, yeah, and then there was like the drums. I got into the drums, but more just playing on my bed with like spoons or wooden spoons. Uh, I had one particular uh, bed sheet. I think it was a bed sheet that had a a pattern that was uh, like squares, right? Like kind of very evenly spaced squares that became the Uh, drums, you know? And I had, I had, my dad had got me like a a drum pad, you know, those rubber drum pads, Mm -hmm. rubber drum, that became like the hat. (laughs) So like, I'd be like this on the drum pad and with, you know, and I I don't know. Are you boxing it too? No, I didn't know about that at the time. uh, but I would play like, you know, records that I was into. This is when I was like nine, 10. And then I started getting into the guitar. Got a, got a great guitar teacher, a guy named Bob Ankner. I know he's on Facebook somewhere. Um, uh, he was a real uh, seismic moment for me. Just his, uh, not only was he a great player and a very versatile player, but he looked like a combination of Jimmy Page and Brian May. Wow. Big and hair. I think back now, he was like a man to me. Like in my image, he was this man. He was actually 22 years old. Oh, wow. Uh, he had this great sunburst, Les Paul. I just idolized the guy. And, um, and he really uncovered uh, very naturally sort of what I loved about learning the guitar. Um, and um, I, I still started getting in bands. And the bands I was, I was obsessed with simultaneously, um, the, the, the heavy metal, but specifically Van Halen more than anything else. Uh, they were my adolescence. Eddie Van Halen was the most important figure pretty much in my formative years. Um, David Lee Roth was a close second just in terms mm-hmm. of swagger. Yeah. Uh, and you know, appeal. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but they were just all I cared about the guitar playing. And then I was into all kinds of shredders, you know, the Ingbays. I loved Al Miola. I loved uh, Neil Schoen journey. I loved, uh, George Benson, you know, a jazz guy, but I just couldn't get over him. Um, but also I was always listening to uh, pop radio. So I loved, and you know, in the, in the 70s, in an hour on the, the, the biggest pop station, you would hear in order, you know, in no 
particularly you hear the Eagles and then Fleetwood Mac and then Stevie Wonder and then, you know, Elton, early Elton John and Billy Joel. And then you like Casey like, Kasem doing the, the top 40. Yeah. Earth, Wind and Fire. Right. Yep. Doobie Brothers, like uh, Pink Floyd. It, it was just James Taylor, Joni Mitchell. Like I can't even stop thinking of them. Bob Dylan, whoever you want. Yep. It was this endless uh, array of completely unique melodists, lyricists, songwriters, and sounds. And everybody was so, they were each had like their own fingerprint, you know, right. as artists. And um, it's been a drag because over the decades, that's really sort of eroded to, to a certain degree, at least to me, I don't want to sound like, you know, get off my lawn or anything, but you know, <laughs> music wasn't driven by the thing that pop sounds like now. There was, you know, there wasn't the equivalent of like, oh well, EDM is 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 the thing, or right. uh, hip hop is is really made a comeback and it's influencing all the pop records. Oh, it's all eight oh eight drum kits. It's all, you know, it's it's all. Well, there was disco kids. sucks back then, right? Was that uh, Sorry? disco sucks? Was that when did that uh, make its thing? Disco that whole, sucks. Yeah, remember everyone was like disco sucks. Well, sure, the backlash to how big it had been, but yeah. disco was an incredible form of music. Oh, yeah. it, was, it was very. It was really complex. It was I know. Really I never had to play. I mean, this this wasn't some dopey four on the floor with a sample and a guy rapping over it. No right. Way. That's really crazy. A lot of the people who said disco sucked were the people who were you know the three chord uh, you know monsters. They, you know, that's all they had. Sure. And there's just as much of to be. I mean, listen, it's really hard. It's just as hard, if not harder, to do something special with three chords. You know. True. But yeah. the thing was, you know, you had this diversity in sound and and styles and music. You'd also have an artist that like, you know, take an early Elton John album, you'd have an out, you'd have a song that was like a funk thing. Then you'd have like a beautiful ballad. Then you'd have like a country sounding thing. Then you'd have like a soulful kind of a thing. Yep. Then you'd have like a gospel sounding thing. And it just all sounded like Elton because these were all influences. And I think that's why I started to become interested in these songs and the songs, the writing of them. Uh, Paul McCartney, massive, massive, massive influence for me. Um, and so I was also really into songwriting as I was getting my shred on, you know, um, and I, I was generally the, the chief songwriter in whatever band I was in, or mm -hmm. one of them. Uh, Do you remember uh, your first song you wrote? I remember the first song I thought I wrote. Okay. Uh, I, I just remember it was called Blackjack. And I think it was a little more than that. I thought that was a cool title. And maybe there was a guitar chord change. I don't know <laughs> if I ever wrote this song <laughs> or not. I was probably nine or 10. Um, but Blackjack. Uh, I remember the first song I ever recorded, like went in the studio with a band. Uh, I was a 14. It was a song called I Want to Know uh, that I had written. Um, it was pretty good. I mean, Where was yeah. the studio? I wish I could remember the name of it. It was in New York City, so it was a big deal. We all went into wow, New York City. Okay. Like yeah. Our parents took us in, obviously, with like children, basically. <laughs> um, and we, uh, we laid it down. I think we did that and another song that my bass player, uh, who actually went on to be a quite legendary, a guy named Dan Lilker, um, who was in a band called Nuclear Assault, and he was a oh, big yeah. influence uh, mm -hmm. on the pop punk metal thing. Uh, mm -hmm. um, he's really a legend. It's amazing. Um, it's funny because he was my bass player. He was the first guy that I met as a kid who also had a certain a certain um, um, protege vibe about him. Like he he just naturally was a great bass player. Na just a very musical thinker. He could write a song, um, and he was a sweetheart. Um, we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun, Dan and I. Um, I haven't talked to him in decades, um, but I hope we reconnect at some point. And then, uh, just funny side note also, in that same uh, spirit, there was also a, a kid that used to hang out with us. This is a band I was in called White Heat. That was the first serious band I was in, White Heat. Uh, and uh, there was a guy that was sort of like our, our de facto roadie at the time. He was like this really sweet kid. Um, he would like help me carry my stuff and I, I was giving him guitar lessons and I just couldn't have liked him better. And that was Scott Ian. Oh, wow. Later of Anthrax. And what's wow. funny was he had a band called Anthrax back then. Like he's a real living testament to an unlimited appetite for your dream, you know, for wow. what you yeah. want to manifest. Because I remember for years after I was Friend, friends with him and Anthrax would go through all these permutations. They were essentially just a Judas Priest cover band hmm. and uh, they couldn't really find a singer. That was their, that was their big sort of Achilles heel. They couldn't really find a singer that stuck that worked for them. But we were, I was rooting for them. I even judged a battle of the bands once with, with other guys where it came down to Anthrax versus this other band that really was much better. 
just in terms of just being a pro level kind of journey esque, you know, like just kind of had their shit together. And Anthrax was still this kind of messy, not didn't have the right guy yet singing, right. but we we gave them the W anyway because okay. they were like they were like <laughs> our, our boys, like we, right. we like, you know Anthrax. So it was unbelievably inspiring over these many years um, to uh, to watch him become this huge star. Um, and uh, and we've every once in a while we'll sort of touch t- reach out we'll touch base with each other on Twitter just a little bit. And I think he I think he has a biography out, and I I'm pretty sure I'm in it or something like that. Oh, um, you should. Really be. meant a lot to me that he remembered and uh, yeah. But anyway, that that band was really where I started getting serious about songwriting. And then I had a friend in high school, uh, junior high and high school, a guy who's still a friend today named Brian Koppelman, who has mm-hmm. uh, become a, a massively successful screenwriter and television creator and movie screenwriter and uh, uh, someone I really admire and have been inspired by uh, throughout my life. Um, he's given me probably some of the best advice and made some of the best introductions, not in terms of like career people, but just the right people for what I needed as a creative soul right. over the years. Um, and his dad was kind of a second father to me because I was always at, and his dad was Charles Koppelman. Well, it still is Charles Koppelman, <laughs> uh, who was a, a huge music uh, publisher and uh, exec producer, mogul, entrepreneur. Um, and he was my first publisher. He was the first guy that actually bought a song or two. You know, um, I was going to have a deal. He did one offs. He did one offs at first, and then he offered me a full on publishing deal. Nice. Uh, my senior year of high school, I think, you know, I think he was kind of doing it to get Brian more invested right. in and <laughs> teach him about the business. Right. But I know he also believed in my talent mm-hmm. and Brian was, you know, we were thick as thieves. He was my de facto manager for much of high school. And then we went off to college together as well. Uh, but my first cut came through them. Uh, it was the weather girls, you know, the mm-hmm. singers of it's raining men. It wasn't it's raining men. I'm saying like that when I was 17, but so called March by the Weather Girls, which I believe you can find on YouTube. I'm not ashamed. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's ridiculous now. I, the lyrics, I don't know what I was writing about and why, uh, but boy, it was a thrill. It was a thrill. And I had my, my publishing deal. I was in college with my $50 a week, you know, which when you're 18, 50 bucks a week, man, just Back coming in. in. Yeah. Fantastic. So, actually, as you're you're sharing this, I'm, it's occurring to me you had your uh, your bands and and like that was one part of your experience. But very early, you saw the opportunity and and were provided the opportunity to write for others because I, I'm not sure there's a lot of more so now I'm sure, but back then I'm not sure that a lot of bandmates and people who had a band was their focus. They were also thinking. Oh, I mean, let me write for somebody else. It's completely right. different and outside of my realm. Of, of well, that's a good that's a good point. And the, the truth is, I really wasn't thinking that. Um, it was really Charles uh, Koppelman, who just never really saw me as being the 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 artist of the song. Mm. Now, I don't even think he was sure whether it was because he couldn't separate me from just being his son's best friend at the time. Uh, or how much was this prescience that I was really meant for a different focus, which possibly and probably maybe that was it. Um, but he was the first one who introduced, you know, and then through Brian who introduced the notion of other people singing my songs. Right. And I was never not into that. I just thought that, I mean, that was amazing to me, but ultimately I had every intention of being the artist. And in fact, when I got out of college, um, I, my absolute focus was, think, keep in mind, I graduated in 1988 from mm-hmm. Tufts University. And uh, my, at the time you had Phil Collins, Steve Winwood, and uh, you know, Richard Marks, George Michael, Michael Bolton. You had uh, all these male solo prints, obviously, you know, and on the more yeah. soulful side. All these unique, super talented male pop solo artists that were just dominating the charts. And I wanted to be one of those guys. Um, and I thought I could be, you know, I was, I was, were you uh, a singer too? I could play all the instruments. Sorry. Were you a singer as well? Yeah. Still, yeah. still, still. No, I mean, but like, as in like your artistry, you were like the, yeah, I, was, singer. I was at all. I was doing yeah. it all. I was playing all the instruments. I, I was like, I'm the white prince. I want to be the okay, white yeah. prince. That was what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I was definitely a white prince in terms of I was a spoiled Long Island kid, but, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, but so, yeah, so I thought that was what I was going to do, uh, what I wanted to do. Um, but I simultaneously was playing my songs 
for people. So what happened was after a couple of years of doing the, uh, oh, you'll like this. After, after like a year and a half, two years of kind of doing the showcases in New York and having A&R guys not show up, or then an A&R guy would show up and, and, and be like, wow, you know, in your demos, you're really like this pop kind of synthy thing. But then I come see you and you're like doing these blazing guitar solos. I'm not sure you know who you are as an artist. Mm. And I'd be like, but so, you know, <laughs> uh, How talented I, I kind of did. And I kind of wanted to be all things, you know, yeah. which maybe means I wasn't a thing. Uh, it's like when, when, when a record label would say, oh, you got four potential first singles, four songs can be the, first single that that means you don't have a first single right (laughs) you know when there's the single that there's no doubt that that's the song um so it was kind of the same thing i was like you know jack of all trades and um which come which comes in handy if you want to be a creator of music for other uh, mediums and people so in my uh broke 3 a.m hours of my 23rd year or so i started running into these Tony Robbins infomercials uh, when I'd be watching TV late at night. And he was super young back then. He was like 28, mm-hmm. 29 years old. And, yep. you know, there was a lot of those commercials. Fran Tarkenton was the guy interviewing him back then. And there was a lot of stupid infomercials. I've seen the Floby, you know, the, all these real estate, you know. Yeah, Carlton uh, Sheets. Carlton with- with- Sheets, exactly. Yeah. I wasn't going to say it. Tom Vu. Remember Tom Vu? Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, uh, and and those little guys, remember the the uh, those twins? Remember they were the, they were like uh, I don't want to be politically incorrect. Dwarves, midgets. They were just they were little like. You remember those guys? It was the infomercial? What were they, oh, they, they selling? Like, real estate. Really? And I remember one of the lessons. Tom, Tom they, was was diminutive as well. Yeah, I, one uh, of the things they shared I remember really powerfully. It still stuck with me. Is like you know we would tell our clients find the richest guy you know and take them to lunch and pay for it. Yeah. And, you know, they're like, well, why? They have all the money. They should be like, well, no, because you want to get information from them. So you need to pay them for lunch. And it's like, ah, oh, that's fair. That's, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think, I don't think it's wrong. I think it's actually smart, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's like, if I lose, if I'm pitching for something for a show and I lose to a guy, I usually find out who that guy is and I, I meet with him because mm-hmm. I just, I want to know. Yeah. Be, why? And What's then take his ass. I could learn something from, you know? Yeah. Um, but, um, Watching the Tony stuff, I got really inspired. I found myself, you know, going from like vague cynicism to like, no, there's just something, there's something about this guy. And I just, I couldn't afford it. Uh, I had a credit card, but I just called up and got the tapes, the, the mm-hmm. personal power, 30 days. Yep. Thing. Yeah. And because I was at that. Me too. I had a month. Yeah, I was, I was intro. I was, I was commuting between, uh, you know, the area where, uh, you know, Locust Valley, Brookville, Glen Cove area to yep. Lindbrook daily to a studio that I was working. This guy, Gary Philadelphia had a place called Garrett Recording in Lindbrook. It's like a home studio, but it was a full on facility. And, uh, and I, and he believed in, in my artistry. And so I was trading free studio time for babysitting sessions. Basically, mm-hmm. I didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, which I'll come back to in a second. So almost simultaneously got the Tony tapes, would listen to them going back and forth to Gary's, did the whole thing, the you know, workbook, really stayed with it. And it changed my life. It, it, at least for a time it did. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. you need a, a refresh. Um, but it, the, the lesson I never forgot from those tapes that I still espouse today is it's always your responsibility. You always have control over you and you are never powerless. Things aren't happening to you. Yep. You know, you're experiencing things that are there for you to learn from. There's always like he would say, the worst possible thing happens to you. Abs- tragic, heartbreaking, absolutely the pits of life. You have to learn how to say, what's good about this? What's like a good thing that I can take away from this moving forward? And it, it's just brilliant because there always is. You know, one of the things I want to turn this into a Tony Robbins, uh, you know, infomercial itself. But one of the things I always talk about, people love this to this day, and I always give Tony credit. Uh, Success is the result of good judgment. Good judgment is the result of experience. Experience is the result of bad judgment. Yep. Right? I, I, I love those kinds of analogies. You know, those are real life tools. And so there was something about that experience 
that along the way, I looked in the mirror one day in my bathroom. I was actually shaving, if you can believe it. And uh, I thought, why am I stuck on this being the artist thing? Mm. I mean, I love writing songs and making music happen. I don't really like having to set up these showcases. I don't like the pressure. I love being center of attention. I love being on stage. But there's something to artistry that's different, where there's such a specificity to that person and their voice that only they can put their message out there. Only they can convey uh, who they are through their music and no one else could. And I just thought, I don't think that's me. I definitely think I'm a unique talent, but I could be doing a lot of different things and I should maybe think about being more songwriter producer guy. Um, and I, I believe that was directly as a result to the work I was doing uh, with those tapes. And because I was working in that studio, I was encountering a lot of clients that had shit going on. You know, you had uh, uh, in those days, early, early 90, 91, there was a big Latin hip hop thing going on. And a lot of these Latin hip hop guys uh, were coming through Garrett recording and I was babysitting these sessions. A lot of female artists like Karina, and Sapphire and Fascination, I think we're a girl group and uh, uh, just a, lot of these, a sweet sensation. Like these, these, these artists were having big, big hits. And so I was hanging out with these guys and they were really cool guys. They were fun guys. I, mean, I didn't get the music really at all, but anytime I had to drive one of them to 7-Eleven, I'd be like, hey, you want to hear a, a song that I wrote? I'm a songwriter <laughs> also. And I play them one of my songs. And you know, these guys in their bones are just fans of good songwriting. Yep. So they immediately got that I could do this. They immediately got like, they were like, wow, man. So what are you looking for? I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to make it, you know? And uh, I, I want to do my own thing still, but I said, but I'm, you know, I'm starting to think about just myself as a songwriter. They're like, do you want to write this song maybe for Sapphire? <laughs> or perhaps Corina? You know, I don't know why I'm doing a Ricardo Montalbán impression, but you know, they were, they were, they were Latin American. <laughs> <laughs> um, they just kind of bonded with these guys. And, uh, and I had the opportunity to start writing some songs. I wasn't even co-writing. I just wrote, and my first charted single on the Billboard Hot 100 was a song for a girl, a lovely, beautiful, talented young woman named Karina. Uh, and it was a song called Whispers. And um, it followed like a big top 10 hit that she had just had, which in the Latin hip hop world, you never want to be the single after the fluky top 10 hit, because that, that's usually the hit. Right. It doesn't tend to then be a series of hits after it. But it did okay. You know, I think it got to 47. It just right. made it just over to the left side of the Hot 100. You never met a more depressed songwriter in your life than a guy who loses the bullet at 47. It's, a, it's amazing how your perspective, I was just talking about this uh, on a podcast the other day that I did. It's amazing how quickly your perspective changes when you get some success. Like I went up to my, my buddy, one of my best friends, uh, Ari Martin was working at uh, Epic Records and Marketing and I knew the song had come out. I didn't know when it'd be eligible, if at all, to chart. I knew Hot 97 was playing it. I'd heard it on Z100 a couple of times. I knew we got plenty of ads in the mm -hmm. P1 stations across the country, you know? So I thought, you know, and so we just opened up the new billboard while we were sitting in this office and we were like doing this. And then I got to number 93 and there was whispers by Karina, but written by P Zizzo with a bullet in 93. And we both went, <gasps> and then almost at the same time we went, if it never gets any higher than 90, again, I'm doing a Jewish mother voice. And I have no <laughs> idea why. <laughs> If it never... It's Long Island, I get it. Well, his mom kind of sounded like this. So we, okay. always, we always talk about her affectionately, like okay. with the advice she would give us. <laughs> if it never gets any higher, this is a massive win. This is the validation of my career right here at 93 of the bullet. I'm in the game. Yeah. That lasted for two days. And then I was like, um, uh, when's the next issue? When, when do they when do they post the the charts for next week? I'm just yeah, I'm just curious, you know. <laughs> and I get a call. Uh, oh, went to seventy two. I'm like, oh my god, it's really happening. Oh my god, I'm about to become a big songwriter. This is really happening. Then I went to sixty three. I actually remember the numbers. And then I went to fifty four. I was like, all right, so it's starting, you know, hitting hitting the middle, but it's, it's still moving, still bulleted, still getting airplay. And then I'll never forget it on the phone. There's a radio promoter that I'd become friends with at the time. And I called him up. I was a little like, yeah, so uh, what would we do this to? He's like, well, uh, it's interesting. It went up to 51, but it lost the bullet. And I'll never forget 
you could have dropped an anvil onto my head and another one onto my heart and another one onto my will to live all at the same time. I could not tell you how devastating it was that I only got to 51. Now, oddly enough, it had a brief little resurgence and it, and it did make it over to 47 for a week. I went into such a depression. You know, the funny thing someone said, if you want to meet the most depressed songwriter in the country, meet the guy with the number two song on the charts. Right, yeah. You know, because uh, it changes. It yeah. changes very quickly. It's like a, on Deal or No Deal. You, you get this like plumber who goes on with his family and they're struggling to make ends meet and this is his dream and he gets on there and within 10 minutes of him being the contestant, he's the banker is offering him $620,000 because he's up to six seventy five to walk away. And he's like, there's two suitcases. One has a million dollars, one has one dollar. And he's like, no deal. And I'm like, what are you doing? It's $600,000. 600. I don't think you'd make that in 10 years. I, I, I'm, but like, it's not enough. All of a sudden it's not enough because he, because he instantly. Yeah, based, you, yeah. 93, as soon as I have it, is not enough. You have, the, you have the dopamine rush of seeing it, and then it's, I wonder how much higher this could go. Not that I care. And then, you know, you talk yourself into a frenzy over the next time. And I, I, a very important uh, phone call I had, at the time I, I had become good friends with a guy named Evan Lambert, who is, mm -hmm. I believe, currently the president of Universal, Universal Music College. Yeah. And we've been friends through both in our early 20s. He was one of the A&R guys that uh, wasn't able to make my gig. Uh, back when I was doing the artist, but the reason I, I, I kind of fell in love with him right away is unlike almost every other a &R guy, he literally called me the day of the gig. He said, Hey, it's Evan Lambert. I said, Hey, dude, I, said, I just want to let you know, I'm not going to be able to make your show tonight. I'm really sorry. I'm like, you're calling to tell me this. Yeah. That's, that's good. Like, dude. Character right there. It's yeah. You know, like respect. I, I felt respected. He felt badly. And I remember years later when he was leaving New York, I was signed to Universal Music. This was about eight years ago. He was leaving to come out here. And we had him sitting down. We were all telling stories. And I told that story. And he kind of didn't get it. He was like, well, of course I called. I mean, I couldn't make it. I wanted to make sure you knew that I wasn't just not showing. Yeah, it, I'm not a dick. He would handle it any differently. But, right, yeah. But I'm in the weeds. So I thought I was going to make a lot of money from Whispers and – it kind of didn't work out that way. I'd given all my publishing to these Latin hip hop guys. Uh, and, uh, you know, whatever, it was cool. Um, and I did some other things with them, but right around then I met, uh, I met Rick, I met Rick Wake because I had a song. I had, I had, I was very enamored of him because I knew he was a Long Island guy. I knew he lived mm -hmm. in Huntington or, um, more to the point. Uh, what was it called? Cold Spring Harbor. Was he there at that point? Yeah, but it was, um, it doesn't matter. Was this after Taylor? It was when he had that beautiful house. Uh, yeah, it was, that was Cold Spring Hill. Yeah, after Taylor. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So, um, so I, I always knew about him because he was like, you know, maybe a few years older than me, but I looked at him as a contemporary and he had just mm -hmm. shot to, you know, the pantheon of first call pop producers in the 80s with Taylor and the first Mariah record and a bunch of other stuff. Kathy Dracoli. And, uh, and I'd always wanted to meet him. We knew people in common that I'd ask questions like, what's, like, what's his vibe? Like, what, what's his specialty? Like, you know, I was, uh, I would say I was jealous, but I was just sort of like mystified. Like, how do you sure. get there? Yeah. Yeah. You know? And, um, and then, then uh, I got a, a cut with a, a group on a record, a boy band called the Barrio Boys, a uh, Latin mm -hmm. uh, boy band. And um, I thought I was going to produce. The, their management wanted me to produce. They liked the track of the demo. But the A&R guy wanted a name and they, they got Rick Wake. The manager was really pissed about it. And he was like, it should have been you. I don't want an outside guy. Like, you're the real deal. Like, this should be your record. And I was actually like, no, 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 no. I've always wanted to meet Rick Wake. So actually, this could be a really great opportunity. So please don't make trouble because I actually want to, to meet this team. You know, I, I knew who Rich Tancredi was. I knew who Bob Cadway was. These are names I just knew. And I was right down the street and I had no uh, entree. Right. So this was my entree. And that's how I met Rick. Um, with that At that point, he, oh, was he the co-owner of, of Cove no, with Richie? No, no he, right. hadn't, okay. he hadn't. Whoa, yeah, 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 yeah. The studio, yeah, I think so. Yeah. It wasn't clear, but it was clearly like he was the guy. Right, yeah. You know, there. Um, 
but Richie was always around too, um, obviously. And uh, so, yeah, so like, I, you know, I think I, oh yeah. I, I, I had, uh, I had this, I, I met him. We had dinner. Uh, something had happened. I'll tell you this story because you'll appreciate it. So Rich Tancredi was one of the first guys that I met. And I loved him. Mm -hmm. but it was awesome. I, I really looked at him as being on another level as a synth guy of, from what I could do. He just understood how to make sounds and work with samples and just, I was, I was kind of more just, uh, you know, I just kind of go through presets and come up with ideas. And, right. but he really, he really, he would architect had, some sound more right. science or he's more of a tech guy and an excellent musician. So, um, so there was this wonderful moment that this manager kind of turned into a real challenge for me where, uh, and both Rick and Rich Tancredi, I'm sure remember this story. I tell it all the time. Uh, I did have a tendency to run my mouth back then. I, I, I could talk and sometimes I'd realize I said something that I shouldn't have said. And earlier, the very first time I met Rick Wake, I had written with Taylor Dane and, and uh, Russ DeSalvo. I had actually had the opportunity through actually Evan Lamberg, who was at EMI, put them together and Russ invited me to, into the writing session. So I wrote a song, really nice song. Uh, was that the first time you met Russ? Oh, no, no, no. We had become good friends. I think that's why he wanted me to come in on it. Because yeah. we, had, we had developed a really good writing chemistry and we were doing a lot. Yeah. Um, and, he, uh, and he said, you know, you should come write a song. I think he had written one where he said, you should do, write one. I was like, oh, my God, really? I'd never written really with a famous person before. So I was very nervous. And, uh, and we wrote a really pretty song called Slipping Away. And uh, got a really great response from her publisher, uh, and I, and she threw down a vocal that was just phenomenal. I mean, she's just an amazing singer. Yeah. I got really excited about how good she was. I don't think I'd ever been in the studio at that point, maybe yet with a singer that good. Uh, and I was at the old Brookville diner, maybe a month later, two months later. And she was there with Rick and I knew that was Rick. I just had seen pictures of him and I, that's Rick Wake. And so I went to say hi, introduced myself. And Rick was like, oh, yeah, I've heard your name. And it's nice to meet you. I'm like, yeah, nice to meet you too. I, I've, I've always wanted to meet you. And then I go, <laughs> I say to Taylor in front of Rick, I go, yeah, man, that's, uh, I love that song we did. She's like, yeah, yeah, it's really good. I was like, you know, people are saying they think it's like the best vocal they've ever heard from you. And she looks at Rick's like, yeah, I had the little demo that we did. And Rick's like, <laughs> anyway, I'm like, anyway, great to meet you both. And I went back to my table to sit with my then wife or wife-to-be. And as I sat down, I went, oh, Jesus, what did I just say? That's, they're saying that's the best vocal you have. This is the guy that produced all the hits. <laughs> this is the guy that's the reason she's done all the vocals that people already know. Right. It's not the best vocal she's ever done. <laughs> she always sounds great. It was just naivety. I didn't yeah. mean, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't actually mean it's better than uh, Love Will Lead You Back. It, I just right. meant people <laughs> remember who actually even I don't know like, I, think I, was actually, <laughs> I think I actually meant that as I was hyping myself right like that I was like a, a guy that he wanted to know that got a great vocal out of her but I was just an idiot at the time so that you know nothing ever came of it but I just felt really frustrated that I had said that okay so now fast forward to I get a call from Rich Tancredi when they're starting to cut this song of mine it's called Deeper and uh he said, hey, man, I don't think we'd met, we've met, but I'm Rich Tancredi, and uh, I'm working on the track to your song. Um, and I really like the voicings that you use in the chord changes. I know the chords, but I, I want to do the same voicings as you. So I don't know. I think you live close by. If you want to come hang, maybe have some food and like kind of walk me through uh, how you voice the chords, that would be awesome. And I was like, oh, my God, fantastic. You know, and I just thought it was really cool because yeah. – it's not just the chord, it's, it, it's how you voice it. Right. You know, in, a, in an arrangement. And, and he was thinking like an arranger. So I went over to his house here this great afternoon. I loved what he was doing with the track. His sounds were so much better than mine. And I just was like, I had a great afternoon with him. So, I don't know, a couple nights later or something, I get a phone call. Oh, I talk to the manager of the Barrier Boys. And I say, hey, guess who I hung out with? He said, cool. I'm like, Rich Tancredi, man. I, he said, oh, really? How, how come you uh, were hanging out with him? I said, well, he called me because there were some voicings that I was doing with the chords that he wanted to actually uh, emulate, like like do the same voicings in his arrangement. So it was really cool. I got to go over there. and Who like, was that for the, for the Barrio Boys song or for a Taylor song? 
for the Barrier Boys song. Okay. The Taylor song never got never got okay. covered, but um, for the Barrier Boys song. And uh, and I said, yeah, it was really cool. He's a great guy. I really like what he's doing with the track. And he and, and the jet the, the manager goes, see, that's what I mean, man. You had to go over there and because he couldn't even figure out the chords to your song. That's why I want you to produce. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> that not couldn't figure out the chords. He did what I would have done if he, if I liked the way someone played something. Yeah. So I want to make sure, because I'm going to miss some things. Yeah. You know, he's not a computer. I, 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 mean, he, I didn't feed the MIDI into his head. Like he, he liked my voicings. And it was a way that we got to bond as two musicians. Yeah. And I said all this to the guy and he just wasn't getting it. He's like, no oh, man, see that they're fake over there, man. They're fake producers. You're the real deal. I'm like, I'm not the real, I mean, yeah, I'm the real deal, but they're making a great record. Not more real than they are. They're doing a great job. But I'd be like, I'm trying to get in the door with these guys. Like, I want to learn <laughs> from kick them. It in. Let me walk in them. and be welcome. Like, Please hear me when I tell you that this is good news. I'm excited. <laughs> and we get off the phone. And then he calls me later that night, late. And he goes, man, you should have heard what I was just saying to Rick Wake. I'm like, wow. What do you mean what you were just saying to Rick Wake? He's like, I told him your story about how you had to teach the chords to Rich Tancredi oh. to Deeper. I told him, and he tried to say some shit to me, and I was like, no, man, you're a phony-ass producer. Zizzo's the guy that we want, man. You shouldn't even be anywhere near this record. You're just a phony. You're just you're a shady, phony producer. And I'm on the phone, and I could feel my life ebbing out of my soul. Oh. That, like, here is the, the, the most major opportunity I had with a multi-platinum guy to get in the door beyond just the one Latin hip hop cut that I had had and actually start to have a career that I dreamed of having. Um, actually, I don't even think he had the publishing thing yet. I, no, he didn't. But I just thought I could become a go-to. Yeah. Just like my friends Shelly Pikin and Ar Arnie Roman or, or, or um, like song, Alex Forbes, like songwriters that I knew. Um, that were writing the songs, uh, you know, and, and, uh, for Rick, for Rick's artists. They were like New York people. Yep. Jeff and Alex, like, like all these guys. And I was like, I want to get in there. I want to be one of those people. And I'm, I'm listening to this going, I, I, this, is, this is ruined. Because I already knew that I had screwed up the first meeting. Right. <laughs> yeah, so Rick's like, that guy. And I'm, I'm imagining Rick hearing my name invoked. Probably he hadn't heard my name since then. And this is the next time he's hearing about me. <laughs> is that apparently I'm telling the manager of the Barry Boys that his guy can't even figure out the chords. So I get better vocals out of Taylor and I show his program. Three chords that have been in a million other songs that are in that song, just over his head, just out of his depth. <laughs> and I'm like, Joe, 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 I got to go. I got to make a call. So I call Rich Tech Credit because I knew he must know. Yeah. Because he and Rick were. Yeah. I call Rich Tank Credit, and I'll never forget the answer, the way he answers the phone. It's just the way he said it. He goes, Pete fucking Zizzo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it sounded like he didn't even care. He sounded like he was in, he was in a really cool movie with his people. And I was just this idiot that blew it. And he was just like, you schmuck, you know, what, what's up? What's up, loser? You know, and I was just like, Rich, I imagine you know what just happened, but what the manager talked to Rick, he's like, yeah, 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 he, he, he told me. I'm like, Rich, I, we were there together. Do you, can you really imagine me turning around and going and saying that to him? And I told him about how I called him and I was like, I got to work with Rich. So we were, and I explained what I was doing and he just wouldn't hear what I meant. He heard, he couldn't figure your shit out. Right. You should be doing it. And, uh, and I said, Rich, look, I, I'm really, really sorry that this came back to you like that. I promise you, like, I admire you, man. I, I, I want to do more with you or, or feel free to do my tracks. I, I, I think you're amazing. And I just, I hate, that this kind of toxicity is, is now happening when I'm just trying to get in the door with you guys. Like, why would I do that? I'm trying to win with you guys. Right. I want to, I want to make you guys like me, you know? And he goes, look, he goes, um, you and me are cool. I get it. I, it's, it, it's fine. Uh, Rick, 
Yeah, I'm not so sure. Not so much. That's, I, th- I think that might be and that might be Dunsville. Uh, and I'm like, Rich, I wouldn't blame him, but do me a favor. Just, just I'm asking you, just, you don't owe me anything, but if you would do me this one favor, could you call Rick and just ask him to call me? Give me 10 minutes, five minutes. That's all I need. I just want to have a chance to explain. He's like, uh, you know, I can't make any promises, but I will, I'll, I'll talk to him. So we hang up. Five minutes later, I get a call. Hey, it's Rick Wake. That right there, man, that right there told me, this is a guy I want to know. This is a guy I want to learn from. Because another guy would have been like, I'm not calling that, that clown. Right. I don't, really, I, I, I don't need some bitter fucking, you know, wannabe in my, in my camp. But he called me. And I explained to him. I took him through the Taylor thing. I told him the whole thing. And he's like, yeah, I just, he goes, you know, I thought maybe you were just like a bitter guy. I'm like, I, I, I get that, but I'm like 26. How bitter could I be? I'm <laughs> still in my bitter. early stages. Yeah. Like I'm bitter. I know. I, 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 it's like, I just, I'm just, an, I'm just an idiot. I just put my foot in my mouth sometimes, you know, I'm like the well, Joe and, Biden. And your, your manager was, uh, or the Barrio brothers managers was also, Probably yeah, he wasn't helping. He was the bitter. He was coming from a pure place. Like, he yeah, wasn't yeah. a bad guy. Yeah. He just didn't have a filter, and he wasn't listening to what was really being said. Right. And it, and it, it created some problems. But, but I said to Rick, look, look I'm, I'm, I'm just asking you, just guy to guy, um, you know, I, I admire your work. I, I've been trying to get in the door. I've wanted to meet you a long time. I think I have a lot to offer. I think you would really like what I do creatively, and uh, I just hate that this happened. And he's like, well, look, you know what? Um, why don't we meet for uh, dinner tomorrow night? Let's let's I'll, I'll, let, let's let's go to the Brookville Diner and just just start over. He said, I think you, I think I think we just got off on the wrong foot. I was really touched by that, man. I was really touched by that, and um, and it was funny because I had also played uh, this song that I had written, uh, misled. I read it with my friend Jimmy Braylauer over in Roslyn. The other yeah. guy I admired like crazy until yeah. I finally had the opportunity to, I don't mean until I had the opportunity to work for him and then I didn't admire him. I mean, <laughs> he was like one of the first people I admired I got to be creative with. Right. Uh, and I still admire. But, um, but I had this song and I had played it for Rich, for Rich Tancredi when I hung out with him. And he thought it was great. And he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll play this for Rick. This is, this is really cool. This is really cool. And he had called me back, uh, and said, um, I played it for Ricky. He, he, he didn't really hear it. Hmm. I'm like, oh, really? He's like, yeah. yeah. He's like, I think it's a really cool song, but I, Rick didn't seem to, to get it. I'm like, oh. And I was really disappointed. And when I met Rick for dinner, I thought, you know, maybe I should bring that song up. Maybe I should be a little entrepreneurial myself. I said, hey, man, by the way, you know, I'd given a song to Rich. He told me he played it for you and that you didn't really uh, – dig it and i'm thinking maybe you need to hear it again or something because i just feel like it's a really special song and uh i'm not trying to go around rich or anything but like i, w- I would love for you to, to hear it again and he was like huh i was like what's it called he's like misled he's like man I don't, um maybe maybe i heard it um he goes all right tell you what meet me in the studio at midnight and let's let's listen, let's listen to it again went to the studio played it for him he's like i passed on this and i'm like oh it's a two listen mm. It's a two listen. He probably heard it, didn't get it, maybe wasn't really paying attention. And uh, if I hadn't gone back and made him listen again, and by the way, that's the story of so many hits and artists. Like someone pushed and, you know, my aforementioned friend, uh, Brian Koppelman, mm-hmm. you know, when I was at Tufts University with him, there was a girl, singer songwriter, local, playing around Cambridge. She was studying to be a veterinarian. I happened to hear her playing on the grass one day. And I thought, she's not really my thing, but Brian's going to lose his mind. So I said, Brian, you got to go check out this girl. You got to go listen to her. She's like the real deal. She's like a classic. And uh, I know, I know your taste and I think this is for you. And he went and listened to her and he flipped out. I was like, I got to get my dad up here. Got to get my dad up here. He had to bring his dad up there a couple of times. Hmm. He had to be a bit of a bear uh, before his dad got it. And was like, oh, you know what? No, I, I get this now. I want to, I want to shop this. That was Tracy Chapman. Wow. You know, and uh, it's, you know, you can't just take what's given to you. You, you. you have to be willing to question it. You also have to know when to move on. But, right. you know, if someone played something for someone for you, which is a, a great thing, a very nice thing that Rich did for me, 
but Rich can't control, nor can I, the frame of mind or the moment mm -hmm. when it's playing. You know, maybe he's distracted by something. Maybe he's not paying attention. Or maybe he just doesn't get it at first. So well, anyway, that became... Like can grow on you. Like you, you hear it once, like, oh, okay. And then you hear it again, wait, oh, actually, that's pretty... Yeah, yeah. wow, I get and it. And ultimately, Rick pitched it on his own to Celine Dion, and that became a, 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 a hit with Celine. Mm -hmm. um, I remember him telling me that she was going to do it. I couldn't picture her doing that song, but... Was that one of your first like big artists to uh, perform a song? Oh yeah, I mean I had, had um, I think before then between the Karina thing and and then I think I had done some things with the Pointer Sisters. I had gotten to go out to L.A. and write with this one of my favorite producers of all time, Peter Wolf, mm -hmm. uh, who had done like you know everybody wearing Chunk tonight and uh, uh, King of Wishful Thinking, which Rick then produced a remix of as well. That was a hit. Um, but yeah, Celine was starting to blow up, you know. Uh, she wasn't quite what she became, but she was, you know, Beauty and the Beast, and If You Asked Me To, and then this was going to be the next record, which of course had Power of Love, which just yep. took her through the roof. And then I was the next single. Right. Uh, with Miss Letters. Once again, I was following a Huge. massive, <laughs> ridiculously big, so same thing as Karina, ridiculously big song that then they put the next one out, but a lot of radio still playing the first one, and they kind of don't want to play two singles at the right. same time. Um, but it was still, it still did great and it did great all over the world. And that was my first big song. And I, and I, that was a lesson learned like, okay, you got to know, but don't be afraid to go back and make sure, you know? Well, and yeah, that's so important. I think right now, and I saw that also in music, but it's not just the music industry, that persistence and that willingness to just <laughs> stay at it. You know, you use Scott Ian as an example, you use like, there's so or many times Rock talks about uh, Colonel Sanders. I tell that one all the time. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. How old yeah. he was when he started like in his sixties and how many restaurants he went to offering his recipe for free before one would try it. I think it was over a thousand restaurants. Yeah. And you know. it's, it, and it's so powerful because right now I think we're in a time where people are finding a lot of reasons to give up. Um, with so many different things coming in at us. So, I mean, that's, I think it's really powerful to just sh show that it's a consistent um, strategy. Uh, so as you were doing that at some point, because now, I mean, it still seems pretty early in your career at some point, like, was there a time where you, you just turned off? You're like, you know what? Um, artistry is just never going to be a thing. It's not my, like, not even a focus. So was there a time? Yeah, was there a time that just happened or is it just the next thing you knew, you're like, oh, wow, I'm just writing a lot and I'm not even even thinking about uh, performing or anything anymore. I think from that moment in front of the mirror, it was the beginning of the oh, that was, Okay, so that was it, yeah. And it was a happy moment. I, I was mm -hmm. like, I kind of got to like unburden, unburden myself okay. from, from it because I'd always been a performer. I did right. a lot of acting. I have acting ability. I could, you know, I've been threatening to take an acting class out here and just for fun audition for things. Mm -hmm. I love performing. I still love being the center of attention in a way and hearing myself Why are you talking. doing that? Were you also doing any session work, like either live or like playing on records or was it just, just your own kind of thing? Some on, I mean, some playing on records, people that knew uh, would have me do uh, guitar parts or a keyboard part or two or, yeah. But it wasn't how I was making a living. It was always through publishing and songs. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, the Rick Wake era, and then Rick, you know, uh, subsequent to that night that I played in Misled, he then came to see me. No, that night he said, you know, I'm going to start a publishing company. Mm. I really want it to be a New York thing. I want to sign all the best writers in New York to, to me. Um, and at the time, I had Sony about to make an offer. Hmm. And so he knew he had some competition. And I'm, I'm never forgetting, he called me about it. He goes, look, I'm not going to be able to give you the kind of money that Sony can give you up front, but I'm going to play your songs for Clive. I'm going to, I'll play your songs for Whitney Houston. I'll play your songs for Celine. I'll play your songs for Taylor. I'll get you in rooms to write with people like that. Like I'm a guy who's in the, I'm in the game. I'm not a, I'm not a creative director at a publishing company who may or may not be there a year from now. Right. It's like working for With the head of, the of you know, hundreds yeah. of, uh, of yeah. the writers. The, the attrition rate at most publishing companies, most entertainment companies is really high. I mean, people, they, it's just uh, people, it's a revolving door. I don't know that I'd ever started an album project for a major label 
And at the end of the project, anybody that was there at the label in the <laughs> beginning was still there. Even the label wasn't even owned by the same people anymore. <laughs> Sometimes to the de detriment, death, to death knell for the project. But like, yeah. it was un the turnover was always unbelievable, even in the best of times. Um, so I think, yeah, I really became focused. And there was a very competitive atmosphere in the WNR mm -hmm. uh, with the writers there, you know, me and Billy Mann and Arnie and uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think Russ was ever signed there. No. Uh, no, but he did a lot of... Uh, he was, like, yeah, he was around. Yeah, he, was, he, was, with he, was, it. Yeah. he was part of the gang. Yeah, there was just some amazing writers there. We were all just... We were all friends. We all liked each other. But, you know, we would get depressed when we'd hear each other's stuff sometimes and get jealous when we heard that another one got a lock for the Celine record and we didn't yeah. yet, you know, that kind of stuff. It was a real driving thing and it really became my artistry was being a writer and producer under that... Uh, uh, imprimatur that well, you know what I mean yeah well and and that model I think was I don't know if it was as unique as maybe I thought it was but I, I thought it was the way you guys would produce the song as not like a demo but it was the record hire the singer to demo singer that would sound like the person being pitched to so that the a and r guy or the artist could already hear themselves hear it as a finished product and then it was like yeah. okay just recall the mix and throw the, no, the that's really you know i forgot about that you know that was a very interesting concept that rick had whereas look i've heard demos of songs that had been hits before mm-hmm but they were the songwriters demos. They were right. cheesy. They were very different than what the produced record sounded like. Right. So whoever got the song on an A&R level really had to be able to hear through yeah. to something special. And back then, guys like Rick were the A&R guys. You know, Russ right. Teitelman and uh, Lenny Warnicker and uh, Ted Templeman. These, these guys were, were, were producers and musicians and guys that could hear uh, something of value in maybe a wrongly produced or underproduced demo. So Rick's thing was, we're going to do this the right way now so I can present it and make the artist just picture themselves singing. Yeah. And I think it, it worked to quite a degree and, uh, and turned everybody into a better producer and, uh, and changed everybody's thinking about, you know, it's not just about writing the song, it's how you present it. Nowadays, I mean, I don't know the last time I pitched a song to a record, Mm. Uh, or an artist because the artist all you you have to co-write with the artist um, right for a long time now uh but yeah i think that was unique and he had the studios and uh you know they were spending a lot of money to do all that stuff we were hiring oh, yeah. i mean I, I was able to hire like a horn section i was able to hire like four of the top background singers in new york you had like curtis king and you know cindy mizell and lisa yeah. fisher coming in you know like ridiculous <laughs> yeah like Fonzie thornton like like ridiculous access to like the top talent uh for a demo yep and, well, and I, but it was great as it did turn usually it turned into the record it I became don't, the record right yeah, all those right. elements would stay so his yeah, his gamble was have to redo anything yeah his gamble was he'd get the money back in the budget because he'd get the song cut which a lot of times he did yeah um it was a unique atmosphere um i think there were things that that probably should have been uh, different uh, about the way that it was it was run or uh, some aspects of that. But, uh, you know, that's just part of the value is you sort of learn mm -hmm. you back and go, why didn't this stick around? Why didn't this stay? Um, and then going forward, you kind of learn some things for yourself. Not that I've ever wanted to start a company like that, but um, right. yeah. So when, so peak of my career was when Napster came out, right? That's when for me, I started to reevaluate and, and look at changing, you know, moving into helping people create incredible music of their lives and went on the road with Tony and all of that. Yeah. But for you, how did you navigate those, those challenges when WNR started to go away and all of that stuff started to happen and the studio started closing and you saw, you know, just basically the implosion that occurred what was going on in, in your mind at that time? And, and did you have to come up with a, a new, did you have to pivot for lack of a better word? Um, Not then because as the WNR era was ending, uh, I had Vanessa Carlton and Avril Lavigne mm. getting signed and there were records being made. And I think maybe and M2M, I had had a pretty big hit with M2M called Don't Say You Love Me. And um, so I was able to sort of um, parachute and land into something where I, I, 
I, I literally went right from WNR into a very pretty rich joint venture with Atlantic Records, Lava Records, really, my mm -hmm. friend Jason Flom yep. offered something there because of the success of Avril and Vanessa, um, who, which I can't take nearly anywhere near even half the credit for, but I definitely was very instrumental in terms of observing, bringing them in, helping develop them and getting them signed and then being a mm -hmm. part of the early sort of casting of who they were. Right. Uh, and that's a and r -ing to, to, yeah. to a degree. That's talent development. And uh, so I had that, I was, I was going to be doing that. So I didn't necessarily need the publishing deal anymore for financial uh, stability. And, um, and also, uh, as my deal was ending with WNR, I, I initially thought, and I think this hurt Rick, um, and I didn't mean it to, but I initially uh, was gonna, not going to do a publishing deal. I was going to just like own my own publishing for a while and just build up a new catalog. And then uh, a couple of months or just as I was leaving Rick, I got this ridiculous offer from one of the major publishers that it was just the kind of thing you just can't say no to. And uh, he found out. Uh, and called me up and said, you know, you lied to me. You said you want a publishing deal. I would have, I would have gotten you the money. I would have done this or that. And I said, I had no idea that I was working with a manager and he had found it. And I said, I'm sorry. I just, you know, I said, but this is like, you know, I, I, I have to do this, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, so, yeah. So for me, it just transitioned where I was a lot focused almost entirely on just the artists I was signing. And we but were you feeling the the resistance in the industry from like the labels and the record? Not yet. Is not yet. Okay. So when, you, where you I left, anything yet? Not yet, because because really we're talking about this was like two thousand two, two thousand. Oh, so, yeah. So it's still things were still humming along. Amazing. Yeah. You were still buying a CD to have the song. Yeah. You know, you see people bought records. You know, uh, um, so the mechanical royalties were a major part of my income. Mm -hmm. Uh, as there were for many songwriters, you know, as I always felt like in Hollywood, like there are screenwriters uh, over the years who make, you know, high six figures a year and they've never had a movie made, mm. but they're selling screenplays and they're getting hired to do polishes and rewrites and uh, right. their names are, they're not accredited, but they're getting, they're making a ton of money. Right. Uh, as writers. Maybe that's changed too. I don't, I'm not in that world enough yeah, to no. know, but, but uh, it just, you know, in, in, in songwriting, that just went away completely once MP3 and then. Right. Well, that's, yeah, that's what I was sort of referring to. Napster was when. Napster, right. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. iTunes happened. So uh, how did, really what was going on for you when that happened? What year was iTunes uh, or Napster? Was it late 90s? No, that would, that would have been like mid aughts. Yeah. When yeah. I mean, it's it? like 05, 04. Yeah. Uh, things got harder. I, I, I remember this now. I, I, uh, there are a bunch of artists that I got signed or couldn't get signed whose records never got made uh, or who flaked out or who just for one reason or another just were you know, a year of my life just for naught, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, there's some things going on in my personal life that, that were making things really tough for me as well at the time. And uh, yeah, it was a bleak uh, period. So how did you navigate that? Like, where did you start focusing in order to uh, reinvent yourself, for lack of a better word, or parts of yourself in order to navigate those challenges? So because at the time, I remember now. I actually remember. I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, I had a manager, a guy named Rick Alberti, who became a kind of father figure to me. Um, best manager I ever had. I mean, I never had a manager after him. He was just... Mm -hmm. Uh, I've been actually meaning to reconnect with him. So Rick, if you're watching, uh, let's reconnect. I just love the guy. Uh, and he had a lot of ideas, you know, for me, he saw me as something more than I saw myself. He's like, Oh wait, yeah, he really kind of locked in the deal, the joint venture thing. So post this, we had another idea, which let's get private money and let's start an indie label mm -hmm. where these artists you're developing could all be in one place and it's funded and you have a head of A&R, it's your game. And you know, I was very excited about it and we tried, uh, we just never quite got the financing together and it never really got off the ground. Um, and, you know, I did have a, a very nice publishing deal at the time. So I was able to kind of hold down the fort. Um, but uh, I was looking at new ways of developing artists. I found an artist I really believed in around 2007, 2008. And I got uh, through my kid's school, there was a hedge fund guy who was a, a weekend warrior, a drummer in a covers band. 
who just had tons of money and he wanted to invest in something like this. And he fell in love with this artist that I had. And so it became like an indie project with like big management that David Sonnenberg became the manager. And, uh, you know, uh, I started getting some really, you know, significant players involved, uh, you know, once again, for reasons that have mostly to do with the financial crash. Uh, we kind of lost that guy um, at the time. And um, yeah, it, it, it really wasn't until 2010 that a shift started to happen for me away from uh, the traditional record business, which was Nickelodeon. Mm. Oh, that's the, what, the Blues Clues? That was 2010? Well, Blues Clues is, is, is now. Yeah. But the first time I ever uh, had an opportunity to do something for children's television was I was, you know, doing my thing, developing artists. I don't remember what I was working on, but always a lot of stuff. Oh, at that point, I was starting to partner with my friend Mike Mangini, an incredible two-time yeah. Grammy awarding winning multi, multi-platinum producer who I'd always admired. And I met, well, I'd met him before, but we, we had the same manager. We both had Rick. And then we were both, uh, we were both on an episode of The Apprentice, actually. Uh, we got called. It was a music-based task <laughs> on this particular episode. And they needed, like, real producer guys, songwriter guys to help each team. So that's how we met. And uh, we were very different types. He was, like, he was very uh, enamored of my musical songwriting thing. And I could not figure out how he thought the way he did sonically. Mm. Uh, frequencies, uh, where a record was. He was the guy more than anybody else that made me realize that I'm not as good a producer as I think I am. Mm. That's a record producer. That's a guy who hears something objectively. His ego's never in it. Mm. I'll write a piano song and he'll go, maybe that's not a piano song. Hmm. It's a guitar. And I'll be like, no. I mean, I guess we could try, you know, that kind of thing. I, I would just be like, I wrote a piano song. Let's produce it. Yeah. He's a producer. So we had partnered up and we were starting to develop an artist uh, together. I was always working on a lot of different things. So out of nowhere, I get a call from a guy named Doug Cohn, who was the, uh, one of the video department heads at Atlantic Records when I had my joint venture. He called and said, Hey, I'm now like the head of talent for Nickelodeon. And we've got the show called the Fresh Beat Band. And it's about a, it's about a band and they play little pop songs for, for kids and it's educational. And I don't know how you feel about something like that, but I'm feeling like we could take the songs in a more sort of current direction and maybe inject some new uh, blood into it. Um, would you, would you be willing to get on the phone with the creators and me and have a talk about maybe writing a song for the show? And there was something instantly that I got kind of giddy about. I just mm -hmm. thought, man, that would be so cool to write a Peter Zizzo song, but that like little kids mm. fell in love with music because of that song or first started to dance in front of a TV because right. my song came on. I had never thought about something like that. You know, when you're younger, it's all about using your musical ability to get chicks. Right. Then it's your ego wanting to be like the hottest hand and like the most relevant contemporary guy. And of course, you know, we all always want to be that, but this was a new potential validation and avenue that I had never thought of. So I did write a song, uh, a song called Friend Like You. Uh, and it, it, it uh, led to me writing five other songs for that season. And then I won an Emmy uh, for that show, uh, for my work on that show, uh, which really locked it in as, a, as an avenue for me as a creator. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And I was, yeah, I was, I was working with BB and CC Winans. Uh, I was producing their, I was producing a chunk of their records. So BB and I had become kind of close and we were working on stuff together. Yeah, there was a lot, there was actually a bunch of things going on. Um, but I started regularly doing the Nickelodeon thing. Mm -hmm. And I got another nomination the next year for a song I wrote for Peter Rabbit. And I just became really hooked on it and just wanted to do more and more of it. And then I, I had a lunch with uh, two of the executives from Nickelodeon who invited me to pitch show ideas if I had any. We love music driven shows. I don't know. We, you like to write, right? You also like, because I also would write screenplays. I was sort of a dilettante screenplay writer. I was always enamored of the craft of screenwriting. Right. And I was like, yeah, no, I love telling stories too. It's just not anything I've monetized. They're like, well, look, if you have any ideas for a show, we're, we're wide open to hear them. And that bug never left. And oh, from, from back then until today, that's my goal mm. is to sell television shows. And to that end, I'm taking little, little steps 
year by year towards it. I think then the, the step now is going to be where for the first time I'm going to start being the only songwriter for entire shows. There's a couple of those things that are okay. One of them hasn't happened yet. Uh, I'm, I'm, but it's so far so good. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other one is, is happening uh, and it'll be probably start this fall. As the songwriter, not yet. That's, that's the guy right. who writes all the songs. Yeah. Right. That's, that's, it's going to be, it's a Netflix show. Now, do you change when you were doing that shift? Do you um, is there a a different mindset to writing when you know it's going to be for a younger a younger audience, or are you just kind of doing your same thing and and then just simpl simplifying it a little bit? Like, how how do you go about? Yes, <laughs> yes to all of that. Uh, okay, yeah. Because the beauty of that world is, you can they're they're gonna once they know you they're going to come to you for what you do. Mm -hmm. They want what you do. Yeah. Uh, they'll cast you, you know, almost like mm -hmm. an actor. They'll say, Oh, well, I want the Zizzo vibe on this thing. So you're within these very, very clear and tight boundaries of what you can write about, what the references are, where in the story this takes place, or maybe it's the theme song, which is really the thing you really want. Yeah. Uh, so you've got all these boundaries and this language boundaries, obviously, and uh, it in a way makes you more creative. You know, mm -hmm. it's sort of like the thing of like, if you wake up in the morning and you go, oh, wow, I got nothing today. I can work on that song that I started. I'm going to work on that all day. And you have this great idea about how cozy it's going to be that you're just like in your studio, like in the mix and like you, you get the whole thing done and you get all day you don't do shit the whole day goes by and you're about to do it all day long and you never actually get to it and then you and then you realize you screwed it up but if someone gives you an hour and a topic watch what you do yeah you'll do some of your best work and i feel like with the nickelodeon and and other networks but it's been so far mostly nickelodeon it's kind of like that where they literally, uh, I once did this with my son, Ari, Ari Zizzo, incredible songwriter, producer, artist, check him out. I mean, wow. Uh, I once with him, he was younger and, uh, he was having writer's block. He was like, I just don't like anything I'm doing. I can't seem to write anything. I can't finish anything. I can't start anything. I don't want to do anything. I ate everything. And, uh, he was hanging out by my studio. I said, we were coming back from getting some meat. I said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go up to my studio. There's an open room. I'm putting you in there and I'm closing the door and you are not allowed to come out of that door for an hour. And I want you to write something. And he's like, dad, I don't, fine. I was like, okay, get in there. Take your guitar, get in there. I'll see you in an hour. Close the door. He wrote one of the best songs he's ever written. Wow. Really? Like a key song that the context he's made so far in his life came largely because of that song. Wow. Very cool. People that do love his music, that's one of their favorite songs. I did the same thing with Vanessa Carlton. I, you know, she was a reluctant genius. You know, uh, she, she was more like a Stanley Kubrick as a filmmaker, you know, where you make one movie every 10 years, you know. Yeah. But they'd be mostly great songs that she'd write, but you, you had to really get her to finish them and get her to, like, just do it. Mm -hmm. um, and one night I said, all right, you know what, Vanessa? Um, you sit there. At the piano, I'm going to go home and have dinner with my family, and then I'm going to come back down. I expect you would have written some. And she was kind of laughing. She was like, "That's ridiculous," and but okay. And so I left, went home, ate dinner, came back, and she had written a song called "Pretty Baby," which was one of the singles from her debut album. It's amazing. It, it, it's yeah. uncanny, uh, and I find that too. If I lock the door, give myself a limit. If I have those limitations that Nickelodeon has put on me, I'm more likely to write something special within hmm. those boundaries. Very so, cool. yeah, yeah. I, I love it, dude. I mean, throughout this conversation, there have been so many huge like learning moments as far as like how to apply like easy applicable stuff. Like blocking out time is like not that difficult to do. Oh, but and yet it is. But most people don't do it. Like yeah, they, they the way, don't. I'm, I'm not always. I'm rarely that great at it myself. But I don't kid myself about it. its importance. Right. And I know that if I don't do it, if I don't keep an appointment with myself, I'm going to regret it. And I do every time. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, you can learn things about yourself like this. I know, and I'm sure other creatives can relate to this. 
if I have to write a song, let's say it's a 30 second song and something that you would think you could do in an hour or two, I'll leave the day open. And I know I'm contradicting what I just said. Oh, I've got the whole day, but it's a little different because you have an assignment, you have a deadline. Right. Yeah. So I'll, you know, maybe there'll be someone I want to see, someone I want to hang out with. And, and, and I'm like, they, they, do you have any time this week? And I'm like, yeah, actually, you know, but I, I got to just stay home day and night because I'm going to go in and out of this thing all day long. And the two hours that I'll need are going to be spread out over 12. Right. Um, and it's better that way because I don't go down a rabbit hole. Like for me as a creative person, if I keep stepping away and coming back and stepping away and coming back, I always have a more objective read on what I'm creating. Mm -hmm. So it comes out more uh, empirically likable uh, to right. the next person because I didn't get lost in it. Now, that's me. For someone else, they put their head down, they do something brilliant, they pick their head up and it's just done. That's awesome. I've done that. It just doesn't usually end up being the most significant songs for me. Well, so as you're do, did you change the way because I know you, you, you shared the, you have like the, the assignment, the blocks and, and so forth, but yeah. do you, did you change the way your writing process when it came to writing songs for kids? Like, do you get yourself into a different state? Do you prep differently for a uh, song for a child versus a song that would be for like a, you know, pop artist or something? Is there any, like your process any different? Um, I don't know that I ever made a conscious decision to do it differently. I know that if I'm writing a song just by myself to write it, uh, something will come to me in an inopportune moment. Like during, a, I do transcendental meditation every day. Mm -hmm. Maybe during a transcendental meditation, maybe in, in a dream, or maybe I wake up in the morning and something pops in my head and I'll start voice noting it. And mm -hmm. my process is I, I voice note a lot of stuff. Um, when you say voice note, just hum it into the... the yeah, the, the app on my phone. Yeah. Oh, voice um, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the idea of things. And... Uh, and I do that with the kids songs too. Uh, but it's more as a matter of uh, discipline where I will okay. close the door, turn on my voice notes and start warbling around. But that's also what I do if I'm co-writing with somebody. Yeah. Right? So, so you're not doing it on a piano or a guitar or anything. You're actually just from the ether creating ideas and then going, Ooh, is that going to go to a, that's actually a really good, that, that actually guitar. is a really good question because, okay, here's one difference. If I'm going to write a song, just for pleasure or just or for an artist or with an artist. Say I've got yeah. Pixie Lott or I got Billy Porter. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm very grateful to Billy and I have reconnected after mm -hmm. 24 years and he's a massive worldwide yeah. household name now. Yep. And he reached back out and we're going to write some new songs. We're actually okay. going to record an older one. Uh -huh. uh, we record an older one that wasn't, that never made uh, uh, Oh no, I think we did it after that, but it's a song that he's always liked that we never really mm -hmm. finished. And, uh, and then uh, and with someone like him or Pixie or, you know, any artist that I've written with, there's an instrument right at the top, mm -hmm. either on a keyboard or on a guitar, and we start vibing. Nickelodeon or kid songs or Disney, Netflix, whatever, uh, I'm more likely to immediately get a melody and a phrase of lyric okay. that seems relevant to what they just told me in the conference call or what I just read in the brief. And it usually is something that, is relevant to the process. So that is very different. And then I'll try to figure out the chords that I'm hearing under that and, uh, right. and just, and we go from there. But yeah, uh, although with Blues Clues, with the Blues Clues theme song, um, I, uh, they had a lot of references that kind of didn't have anything to do with each other in the brief. Uh, they were really confusing, <laughs> actually. They had like the original jazzy, jammy Blues Clues music from the previous version of the show, but then they had like Shut Up and Dance and they had like a Ben Lee song. And I was just like, okay, mm. how does that all fit together? And I just sort of, I decided just to like, you know, take my pants off and pick up a guitar and sit there in my underwear and just, just, just act like an idiot right. by myself. <laughs> you know, like basically in the equivalent of my pajamas uh, and just make it as open as like, like just, I was literally hitting things with sticks in my room oh. to get something going rhythmically. And I fell into something, you know, it really was very much just what I would do. Mm. So uh, I think well, you gotta, you gotta trust your own muse in a way. Yeah. You yeah. Gotta trust you, do that? you for a reason. 
that 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 takes time you know where yeah. you listen to your inspiration but also uh well let yourself just vomit up a bunch of stuff and don't be afraid that it might not be any good you know a big thing is a lot of talented people they are worried about appearing talented even to themselves mm. uh, at all times and it prevents them from really getting to anything good because they're afraid of doing something bad yeah and you have to not be afraid to write a shitty first version of an idea of a song something you look back on and go oh my god i can't believe that it started with that right you know or or just it'll change so much from the first kind of cool idea i mean going back to blues Clues for a second if you hear the beginning of the voice notes, it's actually pretty cool, but it's very much like a secondhand news, Fleetwood Mac, mm -hmm. down, 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 very rhythmic and kind of Lindsay Buckingham. I mean, it, it went worlds away. It wandered into this whole other thing, but I didn't stop myself and right. critique myself. I just let it, just let it come, let it happen. Um, um, and a lot of people are afraid to do that. A lot of people, you know, especially if you grow up, you know, I grew up as a young talent where a lot of people around me were just, it was a foregone conclusion how successful mm -hmm. I was going to be. That can really set you up for failure because you go out in the world and guess what? There's a lot of really talented people out there. Some of them are better than you. Mm -hmm. Or they're not better. They're just different. And maybe their shit resonates more than yours right now you got to just not be afraid that just you're you and no one else can be you. And if you're not doing you, then you're a hack. Right. You're, you've got to do you. How do you think that your also your early exposure to Tony Robbins helped with that to be able to, you know, write for the garbage for lack of a better term where you're just not judging it. You are just letting it all come out and then start putting it together. Hugely, Tony, hugely. Um, and, uh, Again, it's, it's, it's about your, you can control your destiny. I mean, that's always been mm -hmm. his thing. You can, you can create your destiny. And you know what? It's true. As hokey as it sounds, when you put good energy out there, consistent energy, grateful energy, mm -hmm. it's mind-blowing how much better things start to get from you. It, it's almost like something hears you and that thing starts to move towards you at the same time. Yep. And you got to be willing that it might move towards you really slowly. Um, and again, you got to, that's, that's, that, that's the Colonel Sanders yep. thing. You got to just, no, don't be, it's there. It's going to be there. You, you can, look, I don't want to get political, but if there's one positive thing that I've taken away from the Donald Trump presidency, as it relates to, say, my ultimate goal before where I want to sell a kid's show, I want to be a show creator and a showrunner. Mm -hmm. What do I know about that? And I realized, you know, if Donald Trump at 70 years old can become president of the United States, a reality show guy who's doing McDonald's commercials, the Peter Zizzo can sell a kid's TV show. Yeah. If that can happen, if that ridiculous black swan moment can happen, then they're saying anything like that, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and you have to believe it. That is so true. And would you notice the people that you have attracted in your life have that same mindset? The, that they too have overcome those obstacles, have hit those walls and were able to push through with that level of consistency, gratitude, open-mindedness, lack of uh, need for perfection as it were in the process Sure. I mean, I've certainly, I certainly know a lot of people like that. I've met them. And then I, I also know a lot of younger people um, who are still trying to figure it out. And I get to sort of impart that mm. concept, like, right. don't be afraid to be terrible. <laughs> you know, like my younger son uh, is sort of, I don't say a victim, but he's sort of uh, an example of like a hugely cerebral and intellectually talented creative person. Um, and then there's other stuff that he's really, he's not good at. He just, just doesn't have certain senses about the world that he, he actually inherited all that from me because I'm the same way. Mm -hmm. And so what I have tried to teach him is, yeah, but you're always going to suck at that stuff. That's not the stuff you're great at. Everybody sucks at some shit. You don't, like, you don't have to tense up and be defensive because you got lost trying to find a place. Yeah. That happens to me 
every week. Well, not these weeks as you're home most of the time, right? But, uh, but, uh, but I just said, but you're amazing at this other stuff. So the stuff you suck at, you got to find ways around it. You know, I have an mm-hmm. accountant that does all my bill paying and does all my yeah. stuff and all my investing and all my saving because I'm not going to be consistent with it. Right. I just, I know that it's a barrier for me that I, I'm never going to be that good at it and I'm okay with it. So what? It doesn't, mean doesn't mean I'm stupid. It just, I'm not good at that. So I have someone help. That's so valuable. And I, and I think that what that idea of being able to accept what you're good at yeah. and not good at. Cause I think that sometimes some of us can get locked into kind of lamenting or wishing we were one way yeah. and, and having, you know, evidences that we should be because, well, I grew up in this environment or, you know, all these things that would come in that would dictate that potentially you had all of those resources available and it's just not who you are. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, uh, that's tough. And, and I think for you, you were able to met, like overcome that at an early age to go, hey, you know what? It's okay. I'm not going to be the artist. I don't know if it was an early age, but I definitely eventually realized that. Reasonably uh, early. I mean, uh, uh, some people are still holding on to that. You know, I think of Uncle Ricky, you know, from uh, um, Napoleon Dynamite. Right, oh, like yeah. the, you know, so, still holding on to being the quarterback and lamenting, and oh, yeah. you know, and and I think the the fact that you were able to do what you did change direction a little bit, right? It wasn't a huge, huge thing because you're still writing and all that, but that's a big part of someone to to let go of, and that oh, yeah. I think that's huge that you're able to do that. Thank you. Yeah, I think, and I think the the the, the, the frustrating thing is that it really shouldn't be huge for anyone to be able to do it. You know, I'm about to write a book about songwriting. I've just decided in the recent weeks, because I've done a bunch of these sort of mentoring things, mm-hmm. uh, online classes that invite me to talk and stuff. And I, I really liked it. And I found like, you know, um, I think what I've learned and been through as a songwriter and how it infuses and informs my sense of craft and sense of ability to finish things and do things successfully uh, would be really helpful to yeah. share. Because a lot of it's about the fear. Fear is, drives most of our decision-making. It really does, if you think about it. Fear yeah. drives most of our decision-making. You know, I have a friend who, uh, who got back into a relationship at, at one point in his life because he was so afraid of being alone and he started to romanticize a past relationship that it had some good qualities, but clearly had proven itself over the many years that they tried to not be one that really worked. Right. And, uh, and they had to relearn that you know, um, because he made a decision in a wrong moment because he was scared. Uh, and it's the same thing. Uh, you know, I just said I'm about to write a songwriting book. Uh, that's scary to me. Mm-hmm. Right. But I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. You know, and and you may, the, the first power, first chapters, you may go, ah, I'm going to redo them. Yeah. yeah. Well, I wrote, I mean, I wrote a few pages and a few other pages. And, you know, I've got a bunch of notes yeah. right here. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the, uh, in the past few days. And um, at this point, I'm far enough along because I'm 137 years old yeah. uh, that, uh, that I already, I want to suck at this at first. Yep. Because if I just go, I'm going to come back two days later and read it and be like, oh, that little piece is great. I'm going to put that over here. And this mm-hmm. thing, yeah, I don't need to talk about that. That's, that's boring. I, I practically fell asleep. You know, you, you pick out little nuggets and then you go from there and then you go, and you do that a bunch of times and eventually you go, I know how I want to outline this thing now. Yep. So the first part should be this, this, and then this would plug into that. It almost becomes like this puzzle mm-hmm. that you start putting together and then it becomes less overwhelming because you've chunked it out in your mind. Yep. It's another thing I learned from Tony, the, the yep. chunking. chunking. Thing. Yeah. Uh, into its, into its uh, you know, uh, I'm blanking on the word, but into its little pieces Yep. Rather than this whole great American novel that you have to be, has to be the greatest thing that anyone's ever read since Tolstoy, you know, <laughs> just write your crappy book, man. Nobody cares. Nobody's waiting. And the people who do care aren't going to notice any of the like issues or stuff that you would go back and go, huh? Oh, they're going to be like, this was amazing. And you don't notice that the stuff that you listen to, the songs that you love, or the productions, or the books, you don't know that those guys also have to take their pants off and run around the room like an idiot <laughs> and want to kill themselves at one point because they suck and they're a fraud. And now everyone's going to find out, and I give up, this is the worst thing ever. And then it ends up becoming, you know, Gone Girl. Right. Or, uh, you know, or uh, Harry Potter or, or 
whatever. Well, so the, the other thing is interesting as, as you're sharing that, I remember oftentimes, and this happened a lot with when I was do, working a lot with Russ, I would do like a mix for him and I'd be like, you know, this is awesome. This is great. And I'd send it in and he'd be like, eh, it's not quite no. And like, way like no, like, and the things he was like, wow, okay. I was way off. And other times I'd send them kind of where I'm at, like, okay, here's kind of where I'm at, you know, just, uh, and be like, it's great. Just, uh, t- you know, tweak the vocals a little bit and, you know, a little, a little here and, and, uh, you know, we're good. I'm like, you didn't know you were done. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, it, it was, uh, okay. okay. Well, the most famous example of that ever was I will always love you. Yep. you. David Foster. That was a cassette. Yeah. Of, a, of a board mix from when they did the strings. Yeah. You know? And uh, and Clive was like, this is the record. And David Foster was like, don't ever call me again. You've just ruined my career. <laughs> and I, I, I would have been Foster in that, in that yeah. scenario. Um, but, but Clive wasn't listening from the same place. He right. was listening very purely and very innocently. And it just, it hit him. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want to change. I think uh, Drops of Jupiter by Train, a similar thing. Mm-hmm. I think it was a board mix from the string date. That's why the strings are so loud. Yeah. And uh, Donnie Ioner just loved that rough mix, and that became the record. Yeah. I think it's awesome. Yeah. I don't need it slicker. Well, and I think that's instructive as well to the the, the rawness and the authenticity, authenticity, the power of that, of just yeah. being real and allowing that to, to just be instead of trying to constantly mess with it to get it perfect, because obviously there's no such thing as perfection anyway. No, well, they say it's the enemy of the good, right? Yep. Well, uh, Jimmy Braylauer used to say, I don't know where he got it, was that was absolutely perfect without actually being any good. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Well, listen, I, dude, I, I, I'm so appreciative of you taking this time. Um, how can people, if they want to learn more about you and they want to start tracking, you know, when the book is going to be coming out and, and all of that. I like, not tracking that yet. I well, got a couple of days just, of notes just, taking under my belt. No, of course. But, yeah. you know, it's just still, I mean, I think you have so much to offer and, and I'm sure that people would love to learn more about, you know, who you are and, and there may be even be opportunities that, uh, that are existing in the, in the ether here that, um, you know. you know, right now, I don't really have any materials that I would say you can go to. I mean, I'm certainly on social media. I'm on Instagram under Peter Zizzo, and, um, P. Zizzo on Twitter. But that's me just being really pissed off about politics most of the time. Okay. So uh-huh. and you're not going to learn about songwriting very much. Everyone's okay. follow me something. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not that, you know, Facebook, I sort of check into every once in a while. I'll, I'll post a song. But they can message me. They can hit me up. Okay. You know, I, I, I'll, you know I'll, I don't always respond right away. Uh, but, um, but I love talking about this stuff with people, especially if you've got a good question, I love to answer it. And hopefully this book will, uh, will address a lot of this, uh, this sort of philosophy that I've developed. That's really not mine, but it's, it's called from all the stuff, everything from Tony to different songwriters and talented Mm -hmm. people that I've worked with, uh, that I've learned from, you know, by the way, the aforementioned Mike Mangini, he was a guy through whom I realized that, uh, wow, they like, I can't ever be great at what he's great at and he can't ever be great at what I'm great at. And neither of us cared. We right. both kind of couldn't figure out how each of us could do our thing, but it made us a really good team and yeah. made us best friends, you know? That's awesome. Um, yeah. I, and I think it's a powerful thing. I remember one time, uh, um, drops, I don't want to drop names. No one's, no one's going to know them except you and I, but uh, Steve Peck, remember Steve Peck? I think about him. I wonder, yeah. I know, do you know where he is or what happened to him? No. Um, he was sick. I mean, he was Yeah, yeah, sick. he had MS, right? He was pretty bad. Um, he was, if anyone knows where, where Steve Peck's at, I would love to, uh, that, that's a message I would invite. Yeah. Because okay. he, was, he was a really, somebody that really inspired me way back in the day. Talented guy, nuts too. Like very, like very <laughs> great. It was fun working with him. But I remember one time he, uh, like his kind of coaching to me, and it was very, it was the opposite of Rick Kerr uh, in this, in this sense. So Steve Peck would, after he did a mix, he would mess up everything. He would take the dot, like if it was tape that, you know, he would say, you know, here's where the vocal is or whatever on like the compressors or EQs, whatever. He would move them around too and put them on different stuff. Like, yeah, so no one can, you know, no one could duplicate what I do. I just messed up everything. I'm like, that's interesting. Kerr, would be like, I don't care. 
because you're going to do something with something I did that I oh, yeah, he would show you exactly. He would literally teach yeah. you what he was doing. You know? Yeah, he's like, because you're going to use it and you're going to probably do something that I'm going to be like inspired by. And it was just so interesting, you know, differences of opinions and, and neither one is right or wrong. It's just interesting to, to see how people look at what they're doing and what they're, and that we all have those little concerns yeah. in some level. Um, yeah. Yeah. And know, honestly, you know. more often than not, and maybe Steve Peck wasn't so much an example of this, but man, he was great. Yeah. Uh, when I get to work with the top, top, top guys, they were the nicest. And mm-hmm. they were also the ones that were the most willing and excited to show me how they were doing what they were doing. Yeah. You're not going to be able to do what they do if they show you what compressor they use yeah. and what the settings are for a vocal. Who gives a shit? Yeah. You're not Tom Lord Algae. Like, you, you can't do that. And I, me- I remember Tom, I remember hearing all from so many people, oh, he hates producers. Don't go in the studio when he's mixing. He, trust me, he's, 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 a, he's, a, he's a bully. He, he's, he's an asshole when you're, if, if, if he doesn't like you. And if you're a producer, he just hates notes. And he just, you know, but he nails it. And he's like the best and he's awesome. And, and I kept having these situations where he would mix a song. I didn't get to meet him. And I'd have like no notes. I, he would just, I couldn't even believe how good yeah. it was. So then I went to him when I had a budget to mix like half a record that I was doing, went out to Miami and I was really nervous being in the studio with him, but I was the producer of the whole album and I wanted to be there. He was going to mix like Kevin Killen doing a bunch of things and Kevin's the nicest guy in the world, but, but Tom had that reputation. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a paisan and he's got it, you know, he's intimidating. And um, I went in the studio with him and um he was he was awesome. He was a sweetheart. Like I'd have a note and he'd make the change. Uh mm-hmm. or some or one time I actually told, came back in the morning. It's a great story. I, I said, um, you know, the, the vocal seems a little overpowered by the bass or the bass isn't loud enough, or there's something I wasn't hearing. And he looked at me and he was like, Really? I was like, Yeah. He goes, Um, where did you listen to it? I said, in my in my car. Well, what kind of car? Uh, it's a Jeep that I rented can we go out and listen to it together in the Jeep? I was like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. We'll go out and listen to it. He goes in the Jeep and it's got one of those parametric EQs, consumer parametric yeah, EQs. And I had, I had it flat. I uh-huh. put it flat and listened to the mix flat. And he puts the mix on and he starts, it starts playing and he starts messing around with the EQs. I'm like, what, you're cheating. What are you doing? I'm like, I was listening to it flat. He was like, it's like, Peter, these aren't NS10s. These are like crappy consumer speakers. Just like make, do what you would do when you were listening to a CD or the radio, would you yeah. leave it like this? I'm like, no, actually I wouldn't. He's like, right. So do it, get it to where you like the way it sounds and then listen to the mix. Uh-huh. It was like one of those ways of thinking. And, and I said, you know, I got to tell you, you got a reputation for being like really difficult to work with for producers. He goes, that's because a lot of them don't know what the fuck they're doing. <laughs> and then they say stupid shit to me and I don't have time for it. Said, yeah. You sent me an organized mix. Your ideas make sense. And, uh, so why would I be difficult? Well, and you're also a nice guy to begin with. So you, the way you approach it, you're very like, you're just an approachable, great person. So you would never be like, you know, hey, this sucks, make it better. No, right, no, I don't, I don't bring in an attitude, Jesus. Yeah. No, no, no. But uh, yeah, or Mick Kazowski, another guy, nicest oh, man in the world, man. He'd give you the so shirt off funny. his back. Oh my gosh. Yeah, nobody would want to see him without the shirt on his back, but I mean, he'd give it to you. Yeah, so funny. I mean, oh. I don't want to get in the weeds of like the inside jokes back yeah, then. Yeah. Uh, oh, we, we used to go up there and, and uh, Russ and I and Pat, we yeah. just go up and hang with there. It's some of the best nights were just. Oh, the studio know. grade mic pre thing. Was yeah. Because <laughs> Bob had that going for so long to such ridiculous degrees. But yeah. the fact that I was going to get to work with Mick Kazowski, yeah, I was nervous and excited. And we were doing the, the slaves for him yep. the night before. And I was driving out the next day with the reels. And I show up at his place. And, uh, He's talking to me, oh yeah, I'm really excited. Like, By the way, this mix is gonna be really great because look what I got. <laughs> and on his wall where all his racked gear was, was a label affixed above a uh, sub mixer that said studio grade mic prees with <laughs> arrows pointing to the thing. Remember? And I looked at it and I looked at him and I was like, he called you? About Bob. He's like, yeah, he's a great guy. I guess you were in the bathroom last night, but he called me and told me like, oh, say studio grade Mike, please. Hey folks, it's an inside joke. I'll, I'll, I'll get yeah. off it. But 
but but he was like, oh, I just got a brother Pete touch. I'll make a whole label. Like he just ran with it. Uh, the the top guys are usually the guys I, I've I've always I always end up like. There's a reason because mm -hmm. they're also you know when people if I'm if I'm gonna have a meeting with a network or a production company or they're calling me to maybe do do something with me on on, on a TV show. One of the things I know they want to see is if, if I'm a guy they even want to deal with. Yeah. You know, I think one of the reasons I won Blue's Clues is, you know, there was competition, but apparently uh, some of the other writers were pushing back about some things and had some attitudes about some things that uh, gave me a little bit of an edge because I heard their stuff was great too. Mm -hmm. And Nickelodeon's like, well, we've worked with Zizzo for years, but he's a, he's a, he's a really easy guy to work with. Um, that's a big part of it, by the way, if you're creative and you're trying to be in the business of being creative is the relationships you form. Mm -hmm. and well, you that's the thing. Yeah, you get you, you're you two things. You're one, you're being super vulnerable. So yeah. you have to be able to be comfortable and, and screw up, fail, write some crappy stuff or sing off you know, whatever it is to, to find the that zone. Yeah. And also you're spending a lot of time with them. You know, sure. it's like a family. That's, that's the other thing that sometimes, you know, the, the lack of glamour in the industry yeah, it, uh, it, it's not all red carpets and, uh, you know, uh, champagne. It's it's getting down and dirty and, and getting, you know, studio tans, which is, yeah. which is what I have still. <laughs> well, luckily, I have, a, I have a lot of sun coming in. Well, not yeah. today as much, but uh, so. Well, awesome, brother. Thank you so much. Um, oh, yeah, this is epic, man. It's been like two hours. I'm by, you know, I, I, I could go longer. I actually, I got to go because I have a tenant waiting for me to come pick up rent. Oh, and yeah, uh, no, I, I got to take please. my pants off and start working. Oh, cool. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not wearing them now. Lesson one, take off pants. Take off your pants, hands. folks. That's that. Yeah, it's going to be the name of my book. Take off your pants. Yeah. You open creativity. That's right. It frees the energy. To, it, really, it really does. Yeah. It really does. <laughs> Depending on how tight your underwear is. Oh, um, well, then anyway, after that. On that note, well, Doug, it's great to see you, man. I love you, brother. And, uh, I love you, too. And, and let's, well, let's not make it so long to uh, catch up as well. I mean, not length in time. The, the conversation length is great. It's I mean, not 20 long. years. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great, man. Well, thank you so much. And, yeah, let's do it again, man. You got it, brother. Mi casa tu casa. All right. Take Talk care. Talk to you again. You're uh, on. Peace. Thank you so much for stopping by and hanging with us. And remember to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast right here. And we look forward to serving you even more. Remember, download your free guided hypnotic meditation at guidedhypnotic.com. That's guidedhypnotic.com where you'll get your free anxiety-busting meditation. We look forward to serving you, and if you have any questions, comments, please feel free to reach out. All right, we love you for who you are and who you aren't. God bless.